Each and every person has something inside that makes us truly special. An inner magic that makes you who you are. There's no one else in the whole world like you, and that is what makes your particular magic so wonderful. This inner magic is the energy, attitude, and happiness that you bring with you wherever you go. It gives you purpose and something to share with the world and those around you. Today's guest has a special talent for helping others discover the magic within. She is a new friend that has helped me greatly in tapping into my own inner magic, and I know will give you the inspiration and guidance to live your most joyously authentic life. You're listening to The Positively Delighted Show, episode number 23. Welcome to The Positively Delighted Show. I'm your host, Kelsey Henry, and in this podcast, we'll be creating a positive mindset through inspirational interviews, music, stories, and exercises for building happy habits. Welcome, everyone, to The Positively Delighted Show. As always, I am super excited that you are here, and I have a really cool episode for you today. I really like the topic that we're covering, which is discover the magic within you. And today I am interviewing my new friend, Liv Haddon. Liv is a clarity guide and the creator of Self-Aware Millennial, the podcast and community for people seeking a joyously authentic life. Her work is built upon her deep belief that every person has a profound gift to share with the world. Her mission is to create platforms and spaces for people to find their inner purpose and then share it with confidence and pride. On her about page, Liv says, I'm here to help you get clear. Whether you're stuck, in transition, feeling stagnant, or totally lost, I'll help you create clarity and a path forward, all in a way that's joyful and authentic to you. In this interview, Liv and I cover some great topics, including how to get clarity in your life, what is your inner magic and how do you find it, our society's need for external validation and how to move past it, and the importance of having a gratitude practice along with a bunch of other amazing, awesome things. And this interview ran a little long, and I didn't want to cut any of it out because it was just all gold, so I kept it for you, and you're welcome. Also, Liv and I recorded an episode on the Self-Aware Millennial podcast about laughter yoga and all things fun and self-care, so check out the Self-Aware Millennial podcast to listen to that interview. Before we get into today's episode, I have a fun little ad that I put together for you guys, and you might recognize the music. So let's listen to it. This episode is sponsored by the Positively Delighted Etsy Shop. How would you like to have more positivity, love, and happiness in your life? Heck yeah, who wouldn't? Want to know the secret to having more of this goodness in your life? Well, the secret to having more of these good things is to surround yourself in happiness because the more you see it around you and notice it, the more you'll attract into your life. At the Positively Delighted Shop, I've got you covered with affirmations to cultivate the positivity mindset and habits of happiness. I love affirmations so much that I've put them on pretty much everything for you, from coloring pages to affirmation cards to art prints and gratitude worksheets. No matter where you are on your positivity journey, the shop has something for you. As a Positively Delighted Show listener, I've got a super special discount code just for you. Use the code PODCAST20 for an extra 20% off your order. Insider tip, this also stacks with any sales, so extra discounts for you. Head on over to etsy.com slash shop slash positively delighted or find the link in the show notes of this episode to get your positivity printables. New products are being added all the time to help you live a life of delight, laughter, and fun. So go check it out. I love talking about my new Etsy shop, if you haven't noticed, but there's just something about putting it to that music that just makes it... mm, Just so much more upbeat and positive. So I just love it. So now that we've listened to this really fun ad, let's get into this amazing interview with Liv Haddon. Liv, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. 
I have so many questions for you. I'm I'm so excited to actually get to talk to you because I've heard so much about you from people who met you at the first RV Entrepreneur Conference because you were like this mysterious person that was there but wasn't. So you're like, yes. I, you're like a mythical figure in our community <laughs> because I remember being at the first event and my friend Catherine, she's like, hey, did you meet Liv? Like, she's really cool. I'm going to go see her after the conference. Uh, and I'm like, I, that's not a person, Catherine. Uh, I have like the list of attendees and that is not a person. And she's like, are you serious? Like, I'm, I'm going to see this person. I'm like, I, I don't believe you. <laughs> That's amazing. And then the second person, our friend Drew mentioned you. And I was like, who is this person that like, just, I, I have to find out. <laughs> and then you contacted me this. and I was so excited. <laughs> yeah. Just the synchronicity there. Like our paths were destined to cross. Destined. Yes. And, yes. I, and you are real, very I real am. and you're here. And we're going to talk about a lot of really wonderful things. And today we're going to talk about kind of the, the topic of discovering the magic within you. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, please. Magic. Mm-hmm. So good. So, okay. Let's just kind of dive in here on your website on livehadden.com. And I said that right. Liv Haddon. Yeah. You killed it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Bonus points. Okay. Yes. So on your website, you say that you are a clarity guide. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means? Yes, absolutely. And I'm actually super stoked that you asked me because It was a labor of love to come up with what I was going to call myself for the services that I provide. So the, you know, the kind of baseline of what I do could be called coaching. You know, Mm -hmm. we've all heard of like executive coaches, professional coaches, personal development coaches, life coaches. Life coaches, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That that kind of thing. And I I have a background in professional training. Mm -hmm. Um, I've done everything from like communication training and coaching to strength training and coaching to facilitating large groups of people. So I have that background, but as I started kind of getting more into an integrated space where it's not compartmentalizing the work version of us and Mm -hmm. the home version of us and our romantic relationships being so much different from other ones. Whenever I started venturing into this, we're whole people and let's look at how we want to live our lives from that place, 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. The word coach just didn't seem, it didn't feel right to me for what I want to be doing and how I want to show up. And so the word that just kept coming to me over and over and over again was a guide. Mm -hmm. Because when I think of a guide, I think more of like a Yoda type figure. I love that. You know, (laughs) instead of like, um, I'm probably going to reference movies a bunch. Sounds great. (laughs) And I think it'll be fine because they're all super popular. So anyway, if we go with the Star Wars thing, if you think about when Luke met Obi-Wan, it was very practical, like, let's train to be a Jedi. Here's how you yeah. use a lightsaber. How-tos and tutorials. and Yeah, it was very logistical and practical, which is really important. He needed all that information. It was a great foundation for his head to wrap his mind around what he needed to start doing to tap into the Force, all of those But once he had that down, his next step was to work with Yoda. And if you remember, Yoda doesn't really tell Luke much of anything. He just says like really cryptic, kind of like (laughs) high level things. And the idea behind all of that is that if Yoda gives Luke the answers, they won't really make sense because what Luke's doing is taking something inside of himself mm-hmm. and pushing it out, right? There's like a belief system there that he, he's got limiting beliefs about what he can and can't do. Mm-hmm. And so it's Yoda's job to challenge and guide him to break through those so that he can continue on his path toward living his life's purpose. And if he doesn't do that, then of course, like the empire wins and all freedom is squashed and Darth Vader rules the universe kind of thing. Yeah. Well, not technically, because whatever. I don't need to get into the... Yeah, yeah. We, we get, movie, I, but, I get it. I get yeah, what you see what I'm saying. Yeah, I see so, going. yeah, so guide felt more right because it feels wrong to me to be too prescriptive. Now, sometimes when I'm working with someone and they're really struggling with something and I can see something that they can't see, I will say, you know, I'm observing, I'm seeing, you know, this. However, I really want it to be more of a, hey, here's a light. I'm shining a light over in a dark space and you need to figure out how to make your way to me kind of yeah. that kind of thought process. So then where I, where I came up with the clarity piece is ultimately what I'm finding 
people come to me for and that I have the most drive and passion for is helping them take things that feel convoluted or they're in transition somewhere and things are foggy and maybe they're not feeling so sure, Mm -hmm. but something in them knows that they need to keep moving forward. And so they're just trying to find that help, someone to help them facilitate moving from where they are now to where they want to be. And the clarity, like just is what came to me when I was really sitting down and thinking about it. I was like, what am I actually helping people find and get? What is the value that you would get out of working with me? And it's clarity. I help you get clear on those things that are most important to you, the things that are purposeful to you, the things that are in your way and figuring out really what it is you deeply, deeply want and desire. Because I think a lot of us will talk ourselves out of those things And as we start talking ourselves out of those things, things get muddled and confused and we lose sight and track of who we are and what best serves us and therefore the people around us. So that's kind of what I mean by clarity guide is like this Yoda type figure who's helping you through transition to like reach this next level that you want to get to um, without actually giving you a prescription. I'm letting you step into your power basically in that way, in that you're sourcing the answers. I'm just facilitating you sourcing the answers. Yeah. I love that because they're both such descriptive words. I mean, clarity just sounds so refreshing and then guide shows movement. And Mm -hmm. I think that's so perfect because on your website, on your about page, you do have this whole section where you're like, you go into, you know, talking about you know, the word coach is not really what I'm going to do for you. I'm, I can, I think you had a section that said like, I, I'm going to take you to the water Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to tell you where to go, but I'm going to help you make that step. Yeah. I, so I'm, I, I don't want to say obsessed because that's such an intense word. I would say strongly focused on, I am strongly focused on taking everyone's I think societally trained propensity to lean toward external validation Mm -hmm. and external guidance. We all, and and I think this is true, especially for our generation, the millennial generation, we are constantly looking to experts or quote unquote adult figures or other people Mm -hmm. to validate that we're moving in the right direction and that we're making the right choices. And that's a trap. That's automatically a trap because as soon as you are making decisions based on other people's approval, you're going to continually make the wrong decisions because you will never know what the right decision is. You're always waiting for somebody else. And you have to keep in mind, as confused as you are at times, so are other people. (laughs) So you're taking direction from a directionless person. They can't, they can't tell you where you're supposed to go. They can probably barely tell themselves where they're (laughs) supposed to go. So I really want people to start dialing that back, that need, and that kind of, I think, automatic response to check with someone else and to really start paying attention to unlocking where their answers are and recognizing that the only person who's an expert on you is you yeah. and, and owning that power and that expertise to have autonomy and choice in your life. And you don't have to be a victim and you don't have to play martyr and you don't have to second guess every little thing. You do know things innately. You, you know those things. The trick is peeling back all the things that are in between you and actually taking action on the things that you know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You, everything you said just like hit me. I'm like, I, I must be your target market. Like it just oh, hit yeah. my way. <laughs> yeah, you, to- you totally are. Like precisely, yes. <laughs> Perfect. I'm like, wow. Like, did you write that just for me? What is this? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So all of that, I, I feel like that would resonate with so many different people because I feel like it's so easy to, to get stuck in your own head. And I know that we, we talked about this even just earlier before this call. And a lot of times we know the answers. And we're just looking for validation, like you said, but we know, we know what we want to do. Maybe we just don't want to do it. So we're looking for like a way out or we're looking for someone to validate that we should do that thing when we already know. Yes, exactly. And we all do this. I'm, I'm just as guilty of it. You know, the difference for me is I'm extremely aware when I'm doing it and why I'm doing it. And so then I can make better choices around it. I mean, all of us are doing that and all of us got basically trained to do that. I just think about the school system. I know you had a non-traditional, you know, schooling Mm -hmm. experience for most of your life, but 
you, you know what public school is. It's yeah. you go in there and you get tested and questioned and quizzed. And you know, if you did a good job, if somebody else said you did a good job. Yeah. Yeah. It's so much focused on external validation. And I mean, even like, cause I did public school and I did private school and then I did homeschool and or road school. So you had all of the experiences, all of them, but even like every step of the way was external validation. But I mean, especially as a homeschool student, I was my own teacher. I taught myself all of my subjects and I was self-taught. So my validation came from the grades that I gave myself and the happiness that gave to my parents of the grades that I gave myself. And it was just such a very interesting thing where I'm like, I'm working so hard to get good grades, but I'm the one grading. Mm. I could give myself whatever grade I want, but I was like, no, no, I have to go by the grade book. But then I was, you know, it, it's like nothing really mattered, you know, whatever I put on it. It was just a very interesting Interesting education. It was, it was cool. <laughs> yeah, that is actually really, really interesting. And I think in some ways I can see how for a teenager, that is so much responsibility. It, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot because I was like, am I cheating myself, you know, when I'm teaching things? But if I don't understand, I have to use the teacher manuals because I'm also the teacher. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And we could unpack, I think. Yeah, 10, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I want to dig into you were talking about how you are so self-aware. I think that's a good segue into next thing I want to talk about is your journey to becoming so self-aware and connecting to that magic within you. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, absolutely. So my self-awareness journey started my senior semester of college. I was participating in, and I know a lot of people listening will identify with this, a lot of numbing activities. So when I say numbing activities, I mean things that dulled my perceptions of life, mm -hmm. my dulled my ability to feel things. So yeah. busyness was one of my favorite things. I was definitely a busyness addict. So I just would be doing 7,000 things in the day and sleep for like two hours at a time. You know, I yeah. really wasn't giving myself space or, or me time or self-care was just constantly doing, 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 going, going, going. Um, I was drinking and partying all the time. Yeah. Um, with people I didn't even like. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, it's like, oh, there's booze here. There's weed here. I can just, you know, check out entirely. I was doing those kinds of things. I was, what I'd say one of, one of my Achilles heels is um, getting lost inside of relationships. And mm -hmm. I don't even mean romantic ones at all because I've only had one boyfriend in my life and I married him. So... <laughs> Um, the, <laughs> I would get lost in my relationships with, you know, my, my closest friends. Um, yeah. I was a, a rower. I went to the university of Oklahoma. I was on the rowing team. So oh, getting wow. like wrapping my identity in like what it meant to be like a rower and, and mm -hmm. to be a division one athlete, like wrapping myself in that kind of relationship. So I really was very asleep. You know, I was kind of just doing what I thought I was supposed to do yeah. and trying to make it to the next day. And if making it to the next day meant, be anywhere but actually in your body in the present, I was mm. doing that. Yeah. Which, as you can imagine, that just leads to a lot of dissatisfaction, unhappiness, and depression, which is what happened. I was really in a downward spiral, and I just remember there was this one night, and I was not doing well at all, and I was definitely at a point where I was like, I can't take much more of this. I'm going to break. And so I just like, you know, those where you feel like the whole world's heavy and crashing down on you, yeah. and you just start bawling and you can't stop and the snot's going and the flies coming. <laughs> and you're like, how am I supposed to breathe while I'm crying? This is confusing. Can I breathe through my ears? Like all yeah. these things are happening. <laughs> and I just finally was like, I need to do something with this. I can't keep this energy in me. And it just occurred to me to pull up my laptop and start writing what, what, what I was feeling. And so I just, the first line that I wrote was, I am ugly. And it just, from there, mm -hmm. I just wrote all of these things. And then, you know, finally I got to the point where I'd cried so hard, I couldn't even keep my eyes open. So I, I went to sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, I reread what I wrote. And that was the first time that I was kind of able to step back and go, oh my God, are you really feeling this way? And that was the greatest gift I gave to myself was really writing down in my darkest moment, how I was feeling and then rereading it after I'd, you know, gotten some rest and I had gotten the energy out of me. So I, I didn't feel so much of it so intensely in, in the moment when I was reading. And it was almost like someone had put a mirror up in front of me and said, this is what you're doing to yourself. You feel this way because you're choosing to feel this way. You're doing things in your life that are leading you to this place. And when I read the first line, I am ugly. I just felt so 
sad for myself Mm -hmm. because that statement had nothing to do with how I looked and everything to do with who I was as a person. I was commenting on my character, on my inherent lovability, on my worthiness, on whether I belonged in the world or not at all. So that was kind of the first, my first like being jarred out of this, you know, day-to-day monotonous kind of, I'm just doing this because this is what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, I made some pretty quick rash decisions, which that is also an Achilles heel of mine that (laughs) I have worked on shifting. But I was like, okay, I can't live in this. I was living in Oklahoma and I was like, I can't live here anymore. And I don't know where that came from. It just popped in my head and I latched onto it because it was something I could control. I was graduating in like two months. It felt like a light at the end of the tunnel. So I just decided I was, I was not going to live there anymore. I was going to change my environment. And, you know, I did that. I, I just put my head down. I got through the rest of school. I took myself out of the world a little bit because I felt like I needed to. Mm-hmm. And then I moved, I moved from there to, to Austin, which is where I am now. And the second kind of thing that catalyzed me into this journey is um, I was in between, you know, moving here and then actually starting a job. I had about a week where I wasn't doing anything. You know, I set my apartment up, which took me like maybe one day. I I can unpack in one day. I've never taken longer than a day to unpack because I (laughs) I can't, I'm such a nester. I can't, I can't be in a place that has massive amounts of disorganization. Mm -hmm. So I just am like, okay, it's worth staying up for 14 hours straight and just chugging yeah, coffee. It's your home in place. Yeah. Just so I can feel some sense of ease and I can yeah. go to sleep. So I unpacked it in one day and I was like, well, I have six more days of doing nothing. And this is from a busyness addict. This is from someone yeah. who really jam packs her schedule. Was that scary? Yes. <laughs> So I, I tapped into another one of my favorite numbing activities, which is to watch copious amounts of television. (laughs) Yeah. I've been guilty of that one. (laughs) Oh yeah. We all are. It's an easy one. And and it's relatively harmless if you're, you know, not watching TV 24 seven. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to watch a bunch of TV and I'll, you know, just do that all day and give myself the excuse of you're starting work in a week. This is the only chance you'll have to watch TV. So I decide out of nowhere to turn on the biggest loser and watch this season. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and there was this one girl on there. Her name was Danny. And there was something about her that I just connected with off the bat, maybe kindred souls, or, mm-hmm. or I saw something of myself in her. And, you know, I really connected with her from the first episode. And then I think every season they they all run a 5K or walk a 5K. So the idea is that they're just supposed to finish it. Yeah. And she decided, she just looked at the camera and she was like, I'm going to run the whole thing. I don't care how slow it is. I don't care how much it hurts. I'm going to run the whole thing. And I was like, oh, you can't do that. You're like 300 pounds. There's no way you're going to be able to do that. She did it. Wow. And I was, I, I, I just felt the power of that. I just, yeah. something in me was like, she said she was going to do it. And physiologically, she should not have been able to. There's no godly reason that she should have been able to move her body around there and beat the odds of her head telling her, your lungs hurt. You can't breathe. Your legs hurt. Your joints hurt. And she did it. She finished it. And just the look of pure bliss and joy on her face that just clicked with me. And I just remember thinking, if she can do that, I can do that. So then I started, you know, I started in a physical space. I started running. I was very overweight at the time and super uh, um, out of shape just from, you know, all the drinking and not doing good things to my body. So I started eating cleaner and um, I did one of those elimination diets to figure out what was inflaming my system. And I started running and participating in the community. And it's like, so slowly from there, I just started to try to tap into my mindset a little more of just, okay, if I say I want to do this, I can do this. Yeah. And then bridging the gap with like, okay, well now I said, I'm going to do it. How am I going to make that happen? And (laughs) focusing more on that, then I can't do it. So that's where it started. And then I got super blessed um, to be working with a company that did a lot of um, professional development and personal development inside of organizations. So I got the, and this is really where um, the self-awareness got, got stickiness and a skill (laughs) set attached to it. Uh, I started with Strengths Finder. Have you heard of Gallup Strengths Finder? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. I love the Strengths Finder test. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I'm a huge, huge fan. And it's something, it, it actually, it was my mom's company that, that, you know, she was working on this. She's a Gallup certified strengths coach. That's cool. Um, and I was doing, yeah, I was doing like random things for her, like website stuff, graphic mm-hmm. design stuff, editing things. And I just remember her 
extending an offer of like, hey, do you want to go to the strengths training? I know you love the tool. It was part of our company culture. So we were using it all the time. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to go. So we went to, um, there's a, have you heard of Rackspace? They're like a, a yeah. cloud solution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Rackspace is a strengths based organization. Cool. And they actually rent out spaces for uh, strength trainings and they require every single one of their employees to go through strength training. Mm. It's really, really cool. So that's great. Yeah. I went to a strengths training there and I just, the power of being able to look at yourself objectively mm-hmm. and to be able to kind of see where, where you're unsophisticated or, you know, where you're we would use the word weaknesses um, Mm -hmm. in colloquial terms, but you know, in strengths, you call it sophisticated, unsophisticated, or I think, I think Gallup says like basement or balcony and balcony is like a high expression of that strength. And then basement is a low expression of that strength, Mm -hmm. but to be able to just look at that objectively and there's no judgment on it. So I can look at my bottom strengths and see, Oh, deliberative is my 34th strength, which is for people who are listening, who don't know the deliberative strength, is really slow to make decisions. They're very mm-hmm. meticulous. And, and when they do make a decision, it's normally the most well thought out decision in the entire world. And as I <laughs> mentioned before, I'm impulsive and rash. So to see <laughs> deliberative at the bottom and to go, okay, well, how can I be more deliberative mm-hmm. with the strengths that I have at, in the top with my sophisticated strengths? How can I practice that and bring some of that to my life. So really having that tool to kind of look at myself objectively, to get feedback from other people in a way that felt safe because they were mm-hmm. commenting on behaviors instead of my character. That was just life-changing for me. And then from there, I kind of got obsessed with self-assessment. So then I like, <laughs> I've taken so many of them. Um, it's just kind of it's like a, a black hole of just interesting things about yourself. <laughs> yes. And other people too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love talking to other people about their strengths and asking them how it shows up in their life. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, people do the Myers-Briggs thing, Berkman, Mm -hmm. Enneagram, Enneagram. you know, whatever. languages, all the things. Fashion tests. Have you done, have you done the apology languages that love languages came out with? Uh, apology languages. Yes. I just discovered this maybe like six months ago. I don't know how long it's been around. They have apology languages. So you can just go to the same website that you do for five love languages and have an apology self-assessment. And it is so spot on. Fascinating. (laughs) So like, can you, can you tell me what your apology love language is? Um, I actually can't remember the name of it, but the essence of it is that there needs to be like what you say doesn't matter. It's what you Mm -hmm. do. Mm-hmm. So there needs to be kind of this element of like deep, like you expressing deep regret and then actually doing something different. Okay. And it was cool because my, my number one, by far, there's nowhere even close. My number one love language is acts of service. Mm-hmm. So it made sense to okay, me that, yeah. that the apology would feed into the love language like that. Yeah. And do you, does it tell you like how you apologize or do you feel like you know that? Well, I actually apologize the way that I like to be apologized to. I don't know that that would be the case for everyone, Yeah, um, but that was the case for me. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't explicitly say that. I would highly recommend that, especially if you're um, in a close relationship with someone, any kind of relationship, you know, people are going to mess up. You're going to do things that upset the other person, accidentally step on their toes, whatever that Mm -hmm. is, you're going to have to apologize. So you may as well figure out how they receive apologies best so that you're not feel like you're, you know, banging your head up against a wall. Like I said, sorry, what more do you want? You know, so smart. And I am curious about with the strengths finder, because you said you went and you worked back on deliberation. Did you take it again to see if that changed? So I have taken it multiple times and here's what, here's what I can tell you about my experience. Mm -hmm. One, the assessment is in your top five, which is most people, that's as far as they go, their top mm-hmm. five. There's like a 0.9% retest reliability. Mm-hmm. So if you sit there in the same exact mindset and intention as the first time you take it to the mm-hmm. second time you take it, within a 90% margin of error, it should be the same. Yeah. And I think it's 0.7 for all 34. All that to say, if you take it again after you know the tool, most of the time it's aspirational. Mm-hmm. So you are answering the questions mm-hmm. now with a different intention. Yes. Of, Oh, okay. I don't like, I don't like that. It says context is my number four. I don't like that strength. I would rather have empathy. And so then you'll go through and read the questions and people don't do this on purpose. It's not like they're mm-hmm. going yeah. to do that. Now I have seen where someone will go through a really traumatic or profound life experience. Mm-hmm. 
um, which they've actually proven does change the neural pathways in your brain. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then you retest and your strengths could go all over the place. So the thing to remember about strengths is it's not a personality assessment. It's an Mm -hmm. assessment of how you see the world. So it's basically an assessment of the neural pathways you've built up. So it's really tough for them to change dramatically. You can rewire and change your brain. We're learning that. We know that that's possible. So you could do that. And the likelihood of that happening without an inciting incident is pretty low. Well, that, that is interesting because I was thinking about, I took the strengths finder like just about exactly a year ago. And mm-hmm. one of my, my top strengths was positivity, which I was really excited. That was like number two. Mm-hmm. And then um, my lowest strengths, one of them was confrontation. And I was like, well, that's no, no spread. I do not like confrontation. But then like all these different situations popped up throughout the year. And I had coaching with our, our mutual friend, Drew Benson. Mm-hmm. And I was like forced to work on confrontation. And then I had an an interview a couple of months ago with Kwame Christian here on the podcast, who is the director of the negotiation Institute. And so I had all these different situations that came in. So now I'm like, that's really interesting. Cause if I were to retest, I probably would be definitely very aspirational. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah, well I would handle it this way, but would I? Yeah. I think that's an excellent, that's an excellent point. Um, so what we typically tell people about this is just because, you know, and actually, I'm wondering what the strength is because confrontation isn't isn't a strength. But I'm, I'm is it command? It some, maybe it, it might. It, maybe it was that. It was. It's been a while since I looked at it. But it was something about confrontation. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's making me think it may be command. It, it doesn't really matter. But if that's something that's showing up in your life and you've had to create strategies for success to be able to handle that, even if naturally it feels tough for you, mm-hmm. you're usually using something in your top, you know, five, 10, 12 strengths Mm -hmm. in combination and they show up as command just because just because it feels easier for you to not be confrontational doesn't mean you don't have the capability to be confrontational. You would just do it in a way that's different from me who does have command in her top five. Interesting. Oh, wow. Look at you. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Ask you for pointers. (laughs) Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. So, so fascinating about all of the different tests. Yeah. We could um, probably spend an entire podcast episode just on strengths. Yeah. Okay. So you, so back to the journey. So you got, you did like the strengths finder and you did all these different tests and, and when did you really start to, to hone in on the connection that you have with discovering your inner magic and helping other people bring that out in themselves? Yeah. So I had an experience with a client and I, I don't want to say that he was my favorite, but at the time he was totally my favorite. <laughs> I had an experience where he and I were somewhat similar in age. So we were kind of working through some of the th- same things with, as far as like our identity and our purpose and how we wanted our lives to look. Um, again, another millennial. So mm-hmm. we're all kind of questioning traditionalism and saying, well, what do I want my life to be? And he had decided he was going to make this big move and uproot his entire life and just go move to Cambodia and wow. just throw caution to the wind and see how he could build a life there. And I remember, um, you know, we were working together, we were working through things, we were working through some of his personal, you know, roadblocks. And when he got to the, we got to the end of the coaching and he was just saying, you know, this has been really great. I really appreciate you, all, all of these things. Something about his success in actually he didn't just talk about moving. He actually did it. And when he did it, he was so successful and happy and blissful. Mm -hmm. For me, everything just clicked like, oh my God, we have manifesting power. We have changeability power. We have all of this power to be the architects and designers of (laughs) lives that lead others by example of lives that are filled with purpose and intention of lives that are happy and whole and complete Mm -hmm. and are completely self-sourced. And I just remember having this moment where I just smiled when I just saw his post on Instagram and I was like, that's it. This is the thing. This is what I want to do. I want to help people like him be able to say, I'm going to go do this thing and then empower themselves and give themselves permission to actually go do it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that wow. was really when that that clicked with me. And and it, I love the reason that I use the word magic. Well, one, I'm a huge fantasy fan, like grew up reading fantasy, mm-hmm. obviously Harry Potter fan, Luke <laughs> love, love sci-fi, anything, anything like that. And and for me, magic, magic is kind of that 
you can't prove it with science, at least not yet. Mm -hmm. It's those things about being human. It's those things about life that feel unexplainable, but right. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have so much of it inside us. It's just like this untapped well of resources that we just haven't been taught or given the skill set to utilize. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of part of my mission is to help you get connected to that so that you can see yourself for this like powerful, magical, purposeful, deserving of all the great things in the world person. (laughs) And then, you know, go out there and start spreading the magic everywhere else. I have, you know, a really great simple example is and you're what I think you're one of these people actually, because I feel that, that from you, but you know, when you're kind of either feeling really flat or even a little bit low, but you're not necessarily angry or sad. You're just kind of like, ugh. yeah. And you Man. go in, yeah, you go into a space and someone walks in and there's just something about them that catches your attention. And even just watching them and feeling them in your space somehow lifts you up. Mm-hmm. That's someone connected to and in their inner magic. That's someone wow. who has that kind of like core grounded ability to not only tap into their own thing, but to spread that out. It's, it's those people that you really, you're like, wow, they're up to something. I don't know who they are, but they're (laughs) up to something. And I like, I like their vibe looking at them makes me smile that kind of thing. Yeah. It's funny that when you say that you, when you describe that person, I kind of imagine that they're, you know, like They have a lightness to them, but then you also mentioned grounding. And I think Mm -hmm. that that's a contrast that's really important. Yes, that's so something I've been kind of trying to get the word out about to people who come to me for advice is this whole either or dichotomy Mm -hmm. that we live in. We very much live in like a dualist world where you're either good or bad. You're worthy or you passed or failed. And so I love that you mentioned the contrast of, you're right, they, they do have a lightness about them, both just in their spirit and energy. And, and if you're someone who can kind of like sense auras or anything like mm-hmm. that, you might even notice the room gets brighter when they walk in. Mm-hmm. So there's that light element. And then there's this grounding of just, I, I love the word ineffable, but it's just this mm-hmm. unflappableness that you know that the wind could blow any which direction and they're still going to know who they are. Yeah. They can ride that gust of wind and they still can say, I'm Kelsey Henry and I'm about fun and laughter in the world. You know, like they still know no matter what life throws at them. And that's kind of that groundedness where they're really in touch with that. They're really rooted to who they are in their purpose. And there's really not much that could budge them off that. I I love that because it, like you said, it it is something that we, we think of this either or mentality, but those they they seem like they're on different ends of the spectrum, but they go together so well. And I mean, I feel like it's 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 essential to have them both. Yeah, exactly. Because if you're too much in the in the light, you can't see the dark, which means you can't do business with the stuff in your way. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we want to loop this back to strengths and and a, a strength positivity, actually, one of the unsophisticated expressions of positivity is total negativity. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like totally crazy. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> How can you be a positive person? And the thing is, when you are positive to a fault mm-hmm. and you absolutely refuse to acknowledge that there is darkness everywhere there is light, that light actually creates shadows. <laughs> if you are yeah. unwilling to acknowledge that, then the whole world looks like a piece of crap because guess what? There's bad stuff everywhere. So, okay, okay, okay. I want to unpack that really quick just to, to understand yeah, that more. Because I feel like one of the things that I battle with most is feeling like, I'm like, wow, you know, like I, my friends will look at me and they're like, wow, you're so positive. I'm like, really? I just, I thought that thing I wrote was so negative. Gosh, like, is, is that kind of what you're, you're saying is that I see a lot of the negativity as well, or that I'm not seeing the negativity? Like, I'm trying to understand that. Yeah. What you just said is a perfect example. So like I have a, um, I have someone that I I work with and she'll say something truthful and it's, it comes out very kind. Um, I've never heard her be harsh in my entire life. And as soon as she says it, because it's truth and she knows that the truth sometimes hurts people, she goes, I'm so sorry if that sounded harsh. And she completely takes any oomph out of her messaging, Mm -hmm. which was already very kind to begin with, but it's because she feels like, oh, this is so negative and I need to pad it and I need to do the, the." but it's that, yeah, it's the seeing negativity and everything when really there's not any negative. Wow. That, I, cause I feel like that 
gives me so much perspective into my life because I feel like there are a lot of like any, anytime I had like a dark period, it's because I, I do see that negativity, but I'm like always trying to focus on the positive, but I, yeah. Wow. Okay. This is just, I'm going to have to look into this. <laughs> yeah. We could over. totally. Yeah. If you ever want to just chit chat strengths ever, I'm always down to okay. see no, you know, podcast continued part two. We'll save that for later. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I want to go back to, we were talking about, you know, connecting to the magic within you. And so can you tell me about what you do with your clients to help them connect with their own inner magic? Yeah, there's a couple of things I do. So there's, there's two main kind of services that I offer. There's the just more traditional kind of I, I know I, I said I don't call it coaching, but I haven't come up with a. <laughs> there's the guiding, <laughs> yeah. there's the guiding service, which is <laughs> set up in a in a similar structure to coaching. In that mm -hmm. we set up three sessions a month, basically, and we got I give you you know basically a week off for spaciousness and scheduling conflicts and all of those things. And every week, we will basically go through where you are, what you're experiencing, and try to gain clarity on where you want to go and then in, we'll invent possibilities of how you could get there. And a lot of times we'll spend, I don't know, maybe like three fourths of the relationship, whether you, I, I like to do things in, in three month increments. So I do three months. You, you can work with me, you can work with me for six months or you can work with me for a year. Mm -hmm. And let's say for the entire, like for the three months, maybe three fourths of that, we're really working on unpacking what's in your way yeah. and the things it's that- a big part of it. Yeah. I found with most people, especially people who are attracted to working with me, they have a lot of power. They're really powerful people and they've been suppressing that power because they're really afraid of what's going to, uh, what's going to happen when they unlock it. Are they going to be able Oof. to control it? Are people yeah. going to be offended by it? Um, it? Will the world, you know, see that power and get scared of it and then shun them. There's a lot of fear there for people. And mm -hmm. so three-fourths of it's probably just unpacking and recognizing, okay, here in your life, you're manifesting fear by doing this, this, and this. Here in your life, you're manifesting shame by doing this, this, and this. Here in your life, you're manifesting guilt by doing this, this, and this. So then we kind of unpack that stuff. We don't, we don't necessarily do like therapy type things. One, I'm not certified or qualified to be a therapist at all. And two, you don't have to unpack every little childhood wound to move on, right? Yeah. You just need to be aware of it so that you can start paying attention to it and you can start unraveling it and deconstructing it for yourself. A lot of it is just shifting perspective and mindset through practices. So like, let's say Kelsey, for example, we identified that you're manifesting a lot of guilt in, in a a space of money with your business. Okay. You feel guilty to ask for what you're worth because mm -hmm. you don't necessarily feel that you're worth that much. We might spend three full sessions unpacking that and un identifying exactly where that's showing up, how that's showing up, and then coming up with practices that help you debunk that story for yourself, that help you deconstruct that story you have of, I'm not worth this amount of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then slowly over time, those practices stop being intentional and they just start integrating. They're just, it's just how you see things. It's how you think it's, it's how you do. It's really, um, I would liken it to cognitive behavioral therapy. It yeah. is not that disclaimer. It's not that. <laughs> yeah. And but it I can has see the a similar effect. Yeah. It has a similar effect. Over Cause you're time. like, you're changing your behavior. Yeah. And, and the, the thing is there's a huge link between what you do and your, and your mind. You can actually, yeah. I don't know if you've heard any at all about epigenetics. Do you know what that is? Um, not very much. So epigenetics is basically the expression of a gene. Mm -hmm. So there's, let's say, whatever gene you have for whether you're a self-motivated person or you need like external goals to be motivated, mm -hmm. that gene can ex express itself in a very specific way. And the thing with epigenetics is that they tend to get passed down. So mm. like when you're in utero, if you're mom was someone who expresses herself meekly or shyly um, and doesn't have a lot of motivation unless someone makes her do something, mm -hmm. you could inherit that same expression. That's why sometimes you'll see that people comment on this with me, the, the older I get and my mom, like our mannerisms are similar or our laughs are similar or mm -hmm. those kinds of things. You kind of inherit that stuff through epigenetics. Well, the beautiful mm -hmm. thing that we're also learning is that you can change that, that expression and you can wow. actually stop destructive behavioral patterns from passing down to the next generation. 
Fascinating. Yep. I'll have to send you, I have some resources and stuff. I don't yeah. know if you do show notes for your- Yeah, yeah, uh, but, yeah. Send me, send me some stuff. I'll put in the show notes. Yeah, that's great. Um, on my podcast, actually, I did an, an, an entire episode on the, on the neuroscience of purpose. Ooh, cool. And I will link to that as well. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll send you a link to that. And then there's, um, his name is totally just fallen out of my head right now, but there's a doctor who does a lot of work on this and he's wonderful and amazing. And he says some really inspirational, helpful things. So the good news is if there are things that you don't like about yourself that are the same as your parents, you are not destined to become them unless you just want to. (laughs) Yeah. You have, you have the choice. That is the point. Yes. You totally have the choice. We're learning more and more through science. It's like the spiritual like world has known for forever that you had choice and freedom and autonomy here. And science is like slowly catching up. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. 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 But luckily science is now starting to prove, Hey, you actually have choice and you are not a slave to your environment or your genetics or your anything. You can really take control of your power and and turn your life into what you want it to be. doesn't mean it's easy. It's certainly not easy and it's possible. Well, that is just so much interesting information I'm going to have to dig into and all of those resources you're going to send me. So I'm still, Oh yeah. I'm so one of my, one of my top five strengths is input, which basically I'm a collector of things. <laughs> and one of the things I collect is resources and information. So cool. Well, then happy, I will be happy to share. I will definitely know who to go to. Excellent. Any more resources on epigenetics. Yes. <laughs> Any more resources on anything. I just enjoy research too. Sweet. So there you go. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, show notes will be very full for this episode. I can already tell. <laughs> 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 All the good stuff. So do you have anything else that you'd want to add on how someone, if they're listening to this and they they want to become more self-aware and they want to connect to the magic inside them because we all have it. How, how would you say that they could take a few of those first steps? Yeah. The easiest, the easiest one is going to be a gratitude practice. Um, I was, I was blessed. My mom was obsessed with gratitude. She actually has, um, it's actually what she does now. She's like a gratitude lady. (laughs) Yeah. She graded, she graded two different um, journals and I'm not, hawking them. You can practice (laughs) gratitude in whatever way you want. But I'm sharing that it came from her, one, to honor all of the knowledge that she's given me. And two, because I I was doing it unconsciously. And once I started doing gratitude consciously, a Mm -hmm. lot of things changed for me. And so what I was noticing, and and I recommend a written gratitude practice. There is and I can send you an article on this science, but there is something that happens when you physically write something down versus saying it out loud or typing it. So I highly recommend old school handwriting if possible. If you really hate that idea, that's fine. You can say it out loud to a tape recorder or to the ether, or you can type it there. I know there's apps and things now where you can do this, but basically a gratitude practice is essentially committing to every day or, you know, as often as humanly possible, just on a consistent basis, writing down what you're grateful for and not, you can start here because it's easy as people will say, I'm grateful. I have food every day. I'm grateful. I have a roof over my head and all those things are really important. And where gratitude becomes extremely potent and helpful for you to recognize how magical your inner world and the world around you is, is to start becoming grateful for things that are really tough. Mm -hmm. So for example, I had last year, well, two years ago now, a really bad experience with a female friend that I cared for deeply. Mm -hmm. She, in a nutshell, the relationship was very one-sided. I was giving, 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 giving. She was taking, 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 taking. And I reached a breaking point when someone really important in my life died and she never reached out to me, never said Mm -hmm. condolences, never said anything. Her boyfriend did. Her boyfriend wrote me a lovely email, but she didn't. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So that was a wake up call for me that the relationship was not healthy and she didn't actually care about me. I could have, instead of being grateful for her and that experience, decided that she was a B-I-T-C-H and she I was a victim in the whole thing Mm -hmm. and how dare she, and I could have wallowed in the victimhood and martyrdom of all of that. Yeah. Instead, I leaned on my gratitude practice heavily. I was gratitude, gratitude practicing like multiple times a day. Anytime I was feeling shitty, I would go do that. And so through that, I learned that I was really grateful because she helped me recognize I don't have very good boundaries in my relationships. Mm. And I am so... I don't want to use the word desperate, but longing for female companionship that's deep and meaningful. Yeah. That I was willing to overlook a lot of things that I knew were bad for me. 
Yeah. And so she was able to shine a light on, on a shadow aspect of my perspective in the world and, and my behavior. And I, I'm so grateful for that now because yeah. she catalyzed me to go, okay, I don't have very good boundaries in my close relationships. Where else am I giving myself up? Where else am I betraying who I am and what I want? Where else am I compromising so intensely that I'm losing myself inside of this relationship and these other people's identity? And that was through specifically working on being grateful for something that yeah. would have been very easy to be ungrateful for. Wow. That's such a good example. And what I love about that so much is that it is something that on the surface seems so negative, but there are some really positive things that can come from it. And I think we're, we're usually so afraid of negative experiences and negative feelings, but I mean, the reason we feel bad is that something is wrong and our emotions are always trying to tell us something in that moment. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really glad that you said that because that's another thing that's come out of all the self-awareness is me recognizing Okay. Experiencing anger is not going to kill me. Experiencing deep, deep sadness will not kill me. Grief will not kill me. They're hard and they're heavy mm -hmm. in the moment. And the only reason I'm scared of them or resistant to them is because I never allow myself to fully feel them. And I never allow myself to say, this sucks and it will be okay. Yeah. So now in that practice of just like this morning is a great example. Um, you know, waking up with, with judgment and anger, like my first thought was, judging some something someone said to me and then feeling angry because they said that thing. And I was like, oh, I don't want my day to be like this. I knew I was meeting with you today. Yeah. I had a class today. I was like, <laughs> oh, I don't want to be angry all day. Yeah. And so instead of trying to suppress the anger or ignore it, I just was like, okay, I'm going to fully let myself feel it for this next hour and a half. I have full on permission to go, oh, I'm so angry. <laughs> and to cry or stomp or grunt. And I decided, okay, I, I have a lot of energy moving through my body. All this anger is moving through it. How can I expel it? So I yeah. worked out, I cleaned my house. Um, I danced around. I made sure I listened to music that I really loved. <laughs> I, did meditation. Yeah. I journaled. I was like, all right, I'm grateful for this anger because blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. So I treated it, like you said, information. It is me telling myself something. And there's always, always, always an opportunity to turn your situations, your emotions, your perspectives, the consequences of things back as a mirror and say, okay, what is there for me here? What opportunity is here? What did I miss? And what, what can I see? And inside of that anger, I recognized the reason that I was so judgmental and angry of this person's words is because I'm, I'm experiencing some of what she said in my own life. What she said is how I'm feeling and ignoring. And so I was able to bring that up to the surface and go, okay, I'm feeling like a victim here. Mm -hmm. How can I step into my power instead of being a slave to this thing? And yeah. so now there's a path forward. There's clarity. I don't feel so confused or lost or whatever. And I'm not carrying that anger around anymore. It's gone. Wow. And it, it's funny because as you were saying that and you were talking about your morning and you're like, yeah, and I did this and this and this all to get out of a bad mood. I'm kind of thinking over here like, wow, I think. Liv's subconscious was like, I see her schedule today and there isn't much self-care on it. How can I just like wreck this to get some attention back on here? <laughs> and that totally could be true. Because look at totally. all the f stuff you did for yourself in that moment. You're like, I was dancing around. I cleaned my house. I did some meditation and gratitude practices. I'm like, man, you fit in a lot of self-care this morning. <laughs> I really did my whole morning from eight to noon. I had four hours of just doing things that made, filled me up and made me feel great and also helped me dispel energy that I didn't want to carry around anymore. And if you hadn't been angry, you may not have done that today. You might've done something else. I don't know. I probably would have been super lazy and sat on the couch scrolling through things. Yeah. So it, <laughs> Cause it's Saturday. I don't need to do anything. I, yeah. So I, I think that's really, really interesting to kind of like, cause a lot of people are really afraid of those emotions. I mean, I know that when I'm feeling sad, I, let, I, I usually tell myself like, okay, I'm going to let you feel this, but I have trouble with crying because I'm like, okay, if I'm, if I cry, I'm going to want to fall asleep and be tired all day. So sometimes I'll have a little conversation with myself. I'm like, I'm going to let you feel what you need to feel, but can we hold off on the crying until we're alone tonight and we've done the things that we need to do. And sometimes I'll be able to like negotiate that with myself. I think that's excellent. It's an interesting conversation because I had to do that. On my last breakup, my boyfriend broke up with me while I was at a destination wedding and he was off like across the world in another country. And 
I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, I know you feel rejected right now. And thank you, rejection, for this very big sign that this was just not working. I feel you. And I want you to know that I feel you. And I know you want to cry right now. But we have to go to a really fancy brunch in like 20 minutes. And we just can't have this right now. And then after that, I have to get on a plane. And I don't want to be that person that's crying on a plane with a bunch of strangers. So when we get home... I will let you cry, but right now, can you just please hold it together? And I was like, okay, I could do that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's excellent. That's, I couldn't have, I couldn't have guided you to handle that better. You know, that we do have real world constraints, right? We can't yeah. always just be sitting in our emotions and <laughs> you do need to give yourself the space to do that. So whether you yeah. put it on hold or not, it's a you good know. balance, but if yeah, you, I mean, Otherwise, like if I hadn't had that conversation with myself, I might've gone to that fancy brunch and just exploded when someone's like, would you like some salmon on your, your bagel? And I'm just like, what did you say to me? You know, like, it just, you just never know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you say salmon? How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? Or, or I could have been like, he loved salmon. <laughs> like you just, you never know, you know, you just, gotta, like, I miss the way he spread cream cheese on his bagel in the morning. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Which in the moment, like, you're like, oh my gosh, I miss, I miss that so much. And then looking back, you're like, okay, that's, that's a little much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really the difference between you being the master of your emotions or your emotions being the master of you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I think that that's, it's really interesting that balance of, of all of that. And I, I want to go into a little bit when, when you were talking about your services that you do for clients, we, before this conversation actually had a soul seeing session. Yeah. And- that's the other service that I provide that helps people. Yeah. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about how you would describe that? And then I would love to, we, we can talk a little bit about my experience and I would love to, to talk about that. Yeah, that would be excellent. So soul seeing is, I felt as descriptive as I could possibly be in a title of a service. I I feel like I understood what it was. I'm like, great. She's going to look at my soul and tell me what she sees. And that sounds great. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Totally. So basically a soul seeing session is when I intuitively connect to your energy and your field and I ask you permission to see you. And that's capital S C to like really see you for who you are. And then I I get an affirmative consenting yes. Hopefully it's enthusiastic. (laughs) And then I basically just kind of tap into my intuitive abilities. Uh, Most people probably know the word clairvoyance, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like Long Island medium or whatever that show is where she like sees dead people. It's not that kind of clairvoyance. (laughs) Like I basically just get really vivid imagery. Um, I've always gotten really vivid imagery. I'm actually a, um, also a fiction author. I have a That's book amazing. out actually. <laughs> yeah. What's your book called? It's called In the Mind of Revenge. Ooh. And it is actually from that period of time when I was really, really depressed. And the book actually starts with the line, I am ugly. Yeah. So some good came out of that. Whole wow, a lot of good came that. out of that experience. The way that you just like brought that full circle. <laughs> you like that? I Everything's like that. coherent. I like that. Well, uh, I mean, you, you didn't let that go to waste. You're like, no, I'm going to no. make this impactful in my life and write a book that includes it. Yeah, totally. And it was really good therapy for me as well. That's amazing. I will link to that in the show notes. Yeah. All that to say, um, I've just always gotten really, really, really vivid imagery. And I learned, I learned from other you know, spiritual practitioners, other intuitives, other guides, that it's a gift. And if I chose to tap into it and use it, I can help people with it. And so soul seeing is one of the ways I do that. And what, I, what I'm hoping people get out of the soul seeing is one, a sense of peace mm-hmm. that cosmically and overall, this isn't pointless. You're not alone and you can do it and you have everything within you you need to do it. And I'm also hoping that there's a sense of, wow, if she sees me this way and this is resonating with me, then this must be true. And I must actually be this person that she's describing and seeing. I think sometimes when someone can reflect back to you, all the things that are true about you, it kind of helps you remember that you're not a pile of poo that deserves <laughs> to like crap and doesn't deserve a happy life. And yeah. Thing, and, and re- just, and also remembering, I think people get caught in these things happen to them stories. Like yeah. it's happening to me. So many things happen to me. I get dumped yes. on all the time. 
and just recognizing be careful with those words. <laughs> yeah. One, be careful with the words. And two, if I connect to your, your highest intentions and your higher self in the soul seeing session, and they're telling you, Hey, this is going to keep happening. If you keep making this choice, make a different mm-hmm. choice, please. That's why you're getting dumped on. It's yeah. information telling you to correct course. It's funny because we don't think of it this way, but imagine you're like driving down a highway and you keep running into barriers, mm-hmm. but you keep trying to go in the same direction. Yeah. Like you hit the wall and then you, you reverse and you're like, all right, let's try this again. You hit the mm-hmm. wall again. You put your car in reverse. You hit the wall again. Before you know it, you're not even going to have a car anymore. It's yeah. just going to be like you and as a bloody mess in this smashed up hunk of metal, <laughs> but that's how we treat our lives. We keep yeah. running in the same direction and life is like, Hey, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do yeah. that. Don't do that. And we are just constantly doing it. But I think it's one thing for like, sometimes we don't notice the signs in life that are telling us like, Hey, that's probably not a good idea. But one thing that I definitely noticed, like, as you were talking to me and when you were describing my higher self, like I could see myself, like if I asked a question of you, and you were describing me the response you saw, I saw myself, you know, with such confidence saying, Hey, you know, like make a decision on whatever you need to do and stick with it. You are so stuck in your mind. And I could see myself, like I was visualizing what you were saying and I could just see the look on my face. And I was like, yep, I know that that's right because I already had it inside me. And I know that. Yep. Yep. And, and I'm really grateful that that's the experience that you had because that's one of my primary goals is to just help you see that that's all inside you and and you have that all there. I'm just kind of acting as a facilitator of that. Yeah. And I think it's, it's much more like, I don't know. I mean, when I was picturing it, I'm like, why would I not believe what I'm saying to myself? If my higher self has my best intention in mind, like why would I lie to myself? So I, I believed myself. Yeah, which is excellent. That's really great. I I will say though I th- I think for a lot of people the whole external validation thing is just yeah, such a true. strong <laughs> story. It's such a strong story. It's really hard to trust yourself. There's a lot of interwoven self-doubt in mm-hmm. in all kinds of things that we do and choose. Yeah, I I totally I totally get that and maybe where I'm I'm seeing it more for myself is that I I kind of separate like the, the higher self that I was thinking is like a version of me in the future is what I see it as. Mm -hmm. And she's going to know better about things than I am. Just like, I know better than 17 year old me. And I I think that's where I'm kind of seeing it as, is like, it's not just me that I having to look out for. And I, I it kind of comes down to my song that I wrote called broken, where I'm looking at my 17 year old self. And I'm like, this is how I lived her life. I need to look at this as if it's not just mine. I'm making these selfish decisions, but I damaged her. And that's how I got to the situation I'm in. So I think that's kind of where I was looking at it. Like I was looking at as as if she was a different person and I'm kind of having to look out for both of us, but she's already been there. So it was, yeah, that's kind of where I was kind of seeing it. (laughs) Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And for me, that's spot on because, you know, your higher self is supposed to be this enlightened manifestation of what you're here to do in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. So hopefully the older you get, the closer you are to that. (laughs) Yeah. So it is future you. It's totally future you. Yeah. As you were saying things, they did resonate with me because I mean, usually, I mean, you do know what you need to do. You just need to get out of your own way and listen. And so whenever you would say something and before you would even say anything, after I asked the question, I already could know. I'm like, oh, I, I know. And that's why, like, sometimes before you even said anything, I, I kind of just like started crying. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, I know the answer to the questions I'm, I'm asking. And then the, the way that you would tell me like what my higher self was saying, just kind of reaffirmed that back to me. So I guess there is that validation, but it was, it was like, I already could know what she was going to say. Yeah, that's great. I'm so glad you've tapped into that because that's going to only serve you in the future. If you can kind of go back to that place and that sensation that you had, mm-hmm. because Yes, I'm, you know, I was the one delivering the message, Mm -hmm. but the only reason I was able to access her is because you were connected to her, right? That's why I need that permission to see you because it's your connection. It's not mine. I hijacked your connection. (laughs) I'm glad you did. (laughs) But only only, only because you let me. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm glad that, because I feel that, because now, like, I mean, after we took a little break in between the session and this recording, and I, I mean, I was just like getting myself a cup of tea and I was thinking, wow, I feel this now. I'm like aware of this now. I feel so much more self-aware, just like having the visualizations and, and being able to see what you were saying, because I was able to I have that visual component in my mind of kind of reliving that. And I'm like, I can access this anytime I want everything is already inside me. And, you know, like people say that all the time, like the answers are within you, but you know, I don't get out of my own head. And I feel like now I'm like, I had a hundred percent confidence that the next time I need to know what I need to do, I know how to find that answer within myself after this session. Yeah. Yeah. That's so great. And I'm happy to hear that because one of the things that I've been trying to do in these sessions is find out from the higher self, how you can access them without mm-hmm. coming to me. Right. Cause I, I don't want to be the middleman forever. That's pro- <laughs> that's cost prohibitive and time prohibitive, and yeah. and it, and it just you get a lot of phone calls. Whole, well, and it feeds into the whole paradigm of I need someone else to know my truth, and you yeah. don't need someone else to know your truth. Yeah, you're kind of just like helping people make introductions to themselves. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's showing you what's possible. It's the yeah. guiding. Yeah, hey, I this lo- connection's I love that. here. This connection's possible. Go do it, girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we, we had that. Cause it, I mean, I, I asked that, I was like, well, how can I, you know, what, what do I do next time? You know, like what, how can I do better? How can I connect better? And, and you guided me through like what my higher self was saying to connect with myself. And I, I was cause when you were saying like, Oh, her response is like, Oh, she's, she smiled or something. I just, I, I pictured, it. I felt it. Mm. I felt that. And I was like, wow, I, I just tell her, thank you. And you're like, well, she's, she's hugging you. I was like, I feel the love. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're very sensitive and psychic. I definitely think you should explore that side of yourself. <laughs> um, Cause I feel like you could do your own version of what I do for people. It was, it was, I did feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Yeah. So you I just, felt the love. yeah. Well, and you were acutely feeling it in, in real time. That's, that's not, not everybody can access that so easily. So that's, that might be a, another tool you can explore no, is your intuition. No. Look into that. Well, yeah. So I, with that, I mean, that was, that was amazing. So I would highly recommend a soul seeing session for anyone who's interested, but again, you have to, you have to be open to let her, you know, see inside you. See, yeah, see I don't know. I don't know if you read the FAQ on my website, uh-huh. But it's like, if you're skeptical or cynical, yeah. it doesn't matter what I do. I won't be able to yeah. see anything. I no. actually, I on an that, energetic yeah. soul level, have to have your permission to see you. It's not like a fortune teller. It's not that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like if your energy is like closed for business, it's just, yeah, that's that's how it's going to be. And I, I I went into this like completely open-minded, open book here, live, like tell me what you see. <laughs> I saw cool shit. You're you're a very awesome, cool person that I'm so grateful to have known and met. And I'm I'm excited to see we have this really cool, unique starting point for yes. like how we met each other and yes. you know what are we doing in five years kind of thing. Oh, I'm I'm so excited. I, I think it's gonna be great. And I, I I I'm so glad that I I did this with you. That was so much fun. And I I want to ask you a little bit really quick. I, I have some rapid fire questions about happiness that I want to ask you, but right before we get into that. I, I want to talk to you about your podcast, the self-aware millennial. Yeah. And I want to hear like, when did you start that? And, and I just want to know like what it means to you and what you hope your listeners get out of your show. Excellent. Thank you for asking that. And thank you for being a guest on my show. Yes. I'm really excited. I'm really excited. <laughs> you were having me. Publish. Oh yeah. That was a fun interview. The, the laugh yoga was just. Yes. Fun. Yes. That thank was... you for laughing with me and doing a laughter challenge. Oh Anytime, any, I love laughter. It's like my favorite medicine. So I'm down, I'm down with it. So self-aware millennial basically came about two, almost three years ago. It popped into my head as an idea and it kind of came from me looking around and looking at how many things I had shifted and changed in my life so mm-hmm. quickly and how self-assure I was feeling compared to like, you know, maybe three or four years before that feeling totally un- unsure and not confident at all. And I just felt like those changes had happened so quickly. And I'd seen so many blessings in my life from the work I was doing. And I just remember thinking, and I, I think I actually said this to someone, God, I wish my peers had this stuff. I wish they <laughs> all got exposed to yeah. the things I've been exposed to because we're, millennials are just like one of the most emotionally pained and bagged down generations <laughs> there ever has been. And 
the reason that we're so so weighted here is we actually have a lot of time and space that previous generations didn't have to actually feel our emotions. Yeah. We're not in survival mode anymore as oh. a species. And so that means what's left if we don't have to worry about constantly surviving. Mm-hmm. Oh, now we finally have to deal with you know, centuries of emotional familial baggage, our own baggage in this lifetime. Um, If you believe in karma, whatever karma you're working on in this (laughs) lifetime, we actually have time and space to go, I think I hate my life, you know, (laughs) which if you're struggling to even find a scrap of food, you're not thinking about whether you hate your life or not. You're thinking, where's my next meal? So now that we have all this time, space, resources to feel things, we're overwhelmed. We don't know what to do with it because Mm -hmm. no one else has a roadmap. You know, there's a few, you know, quote unquote gurus here and there who say they have all the answers, but they're also still operating in a space that's not connecting to us because we grew up so differently. Mm -hmm. So I just felt like if I could share this with my peers, this could change their lives. It's changed my life. I don't want to keep it to myself. I want everybody to have access to this. And so self-aware millennial popped in my head. And then I thought, Oh, it could be a podcast. Podcasts are great. They're easy. They're accessible. They're definitely something our generation has made possible yeah. even. So I sat on that for two years. <laughs> <laughs> even though I had done so much work and heavy lifting, I wasn't quite ready yeah. to trust myself enough. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I kept looking at it and I kept thinking, I don't, I don't feel ready. And, and I just acknowledged that. And I, I kept it, I, you know, I kept it alive in my spirit, just, oh, that'll be a thing one day. One day I'll do a podcast. And yeah, I, you know, every now and then I might mention it to someone like, Hey, if I did a podcast, what would you want to hear me talk about? And yeah. the overwhelming feedback was what I thought it was going to be like all this self-awareness stuff that you do, all the personal development you do, it would be really great. You know, that kind of thing. And yeah. finally last April, and actually this is something I'm grateful for because this also came out of the, um, that relationship with that woman mm, I was talking about yeah. that was did, felt awful to me. One of the things that came out was me finally going, the, the fact that I was able to, so I've been in destructive female friendships before and it's yeah. taken me years to recognize that it's toxic, yeah. years to recognize that. It took me three months to recognize that this relationship was toxic for me. That's huge improvement. That is ginormous improvement. <laughs> and I remember looking at that and going, Oh, I'm so proud of myself. Hell yeah, girl. <laughs> and then also going, that is amazing ROI. That is yeah. amazing return on investment. Yeah. Like all the time you saved. Exactly. So I think we're ready. I think that's that's enough proof. That's all I need to know that this works. Yeah. It's all I need to know that I'm living it and I'm on this path. And and there's people ahead of me and there's a lot of people behind me. And how can I catch the people behind me up? Yeah. So last April, I just recorded an episode and actually my first interview is with Drew Benson, (laughs) who I I wanted to talk to just because he was so supportive and you know, you felt his self-aware. Yeah. His his presence is just like, whoa, like what are you, what, what are you, water are you drinking and where can I get some? Oh, absolutely. He's one of those people that lights up the room and is ineffable. Yes. And, you know, he's and one of those that you're like, you're magic. <laughs> and so undeniably himself. Yes. That's yes. I get. Well, like, what I, because I had seen him a couple of times before I'd actually like gotten to speak with him. And I was just like, hey, like, just so you know, your presence is like really strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he's excellent and such a gift, such a blessing. And so he was my first interview and it went so well. And the response I got on that episode was just, so great and nice. life affirming really. And it, what was funny is as soon as I finished, like I published the first episode, mm-hmm. I just remember going, okay, well, when's the next one? There was no like, well, we'll wait and see how it goes. Yeah. And I hope people like it. it was like, okay, well, what yeah. are we going to record for the next one? Yeah. And I've, it's just been like that since. So this coming April, self-aware millennial will be one year old. Oh, yay! Yay! Little, have, a, have a little party. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And so my, the tagline for the show is, um, for people who are seeking a joyously authentic life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm hoping people take from it is that here are tools and skills to live a more authentic life and to do it joyfully. I do think sometimes with this, um, personal development or self-awareness or, or anything like that, where you're really looking deep, people can start to feel heavy because it can feel like, Oh, there's so much to unpack here. I have so much baggage. Blah, blah. I can feel like this really awful, horrible process. Like sometimes when you tell people, oh, why don't you just go see a therapist? They're like, oh, it sounds horrible because yeah. I'm just going to sit there and cry and feel all yeah. the bad things. And I just, I want it 
I want there to be the possibility that, yeah, it might be hard and also it can be joyful. It can be both the things yeah. all in one. And to remember what they're working towards. Yeah, exactly. You are working toward joyous authenticity. Yeah. And if that's quote unquote, all you accomplish in this lifetime, you will have accomplished a great deal more than most anybody else in history. Yeah. And whoever said happiness does not take work. No, I'm pretty sure no one's ever said that. I don't know. I do think that we have a, and I don't know where it comes from because you're right. I don't know that I've heard someone say it, but I do, there is kind of this image of happiness is like effortless. Like yeah. if, if it makes you happy, it, ha- it must be easy and it must be effortless. Actually, we have that for a lot of things mm-hmm. that are actually super hard, like long-term relationships, starting a business, maintaining a business, um, getting promoted, finding a career path you actually like, you know, all these things are actually really tough and yeah. you're like, you'll know it because it'll be easy. And it's like, no, like, no. <laughs> that's, that's wrong. Yeah. Easy things are not always the right things. Yeah. And it, I mean, you're doing it. I like to think of it as like, it's tough self-care, like tough love self-care that you're doing. Yeah. It's you're, you're lifting, you know, proverbial weights. Yeah. And it's not that things get easier. It's that you get stronger. Mm, I like that. That's wonderful. And I'm so happy that you decided to put your podcast into the world. Mm, Thank you. Me too. It's been a huge blessing. It's because of it. I've gotten to meet and speak to people like you. So that's been amazing for me. Yeah. So much fun. Well, I have a couple of rapid fire happiness questions for you. Are you ready? Yep. Ready. So I want you to name one thing that makes you happy. Dancing. Girl, good talk. Okay. Uh, one <laughs> thing that you're grateful for? My mom. Okay. Uh, favorite book that you would recommend on this subject? Of happiness? Yes. Um, the Four Agreements by Don Miguel mm. Ruiz. Mm. That is a good book. Mm-hmm. Okay. A, a podcast that you're listening to right now? Oh my God. So I actually love listening to Sword and Scale, which mm. is a- What's that? It's a, it's a murder podcast. It's a true crime. <laughs> the writer so, in you. Uh, oh, I have a, I definitely have a morbid curiosity about the darker <laughs> aspects of humanity for sure. Yeah. I think, um, uh, I think it's like a coping mechanism is like, mm-hmm. okay, if I stare the beast in the face, it won't be so scary kind of yeah. thing. Okay. So yeah. Sword and scales, like some of the most heinous things ever, but it's just, it's, it's good true crime. If you like that, I would say my second favorite is, um, revisionist history with Malcolm Gladwell. Okay, cool. I'm a huge, I, I love interesting and unique parts of human history that, Mm -hmm. that no one really thinks about. I like random facts and quirky stories. (laughs) Cool. All right. Well, I'll link to those in the podcast and something that you do for fun. Dance. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, that's fine. You can say that twice. And then uh, last one, something on your bucket list. I really want to climb up a really gorgeous, beautiful mountain that overlooks a really beautiful forest with running water. And I don't know where that is yet. Part of me is like, it's in Tibet. And then another part of me is like, it's in Nepal. I'm guessing it's probably somewhere in the East, but I've just always, I don't know why that's always just kind of been a thing for me is like, you need to go up a mountain and sit on this place and just meditate over this beautiful landscape. I can see it in my head. So I'll know it when I find it. That's amazing. Yeah. I'll know it when I find it, but yeah, it's a place I go to in meditation a lot because it's just so beautiful. It sounds like a journey where you'll have to go to all these different places and then just like know it when you get there. Yeah. It might be my um, subconscious giving me a great excuse to travel a lot because I, I think, love to travel. I, I would say that that sounds like what that is. <laughs> well, thank you, subconscious. You're doing a great job. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Well, Liv, this has been so much fun. And where can people go to find more about you and connect with you? Yeah. Luckily I make it super easy. It's <laughs> Liv Haddon everywhere. So Liv Haddon.com. Instagram is at Liv Haddon. I do have a Facebook, but I really don't use it or check it. So I don't recommend connecting with me there. And then <laughs> unless you just really want to, I pretty much just repost my Instagram posts on Facebook. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> yeah li- Liv Haddon.com, Liv Haddon on Instagram. And then um, if you're interested in self-aware millennial, it's just self millennial.com. Sweet. All right. Well, Liv, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure. I love talking to you. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Positively Delighted Show. 
I hope you enjoyed this interview with Liv Haddon on discovering the magic within you. I love this topic and I thought this was such a great interview. So go connect with Liv, check out the Self-Aware Millennial Podcast, check out the show notes, and uh, don't forget to discover the magic within you. Have a great day. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Positively Delighted Show. Be sure to head over to PositivelyDelighted.com to get the show notes for this episode. If you like the show so far and you've been learning a lot from the content, I would love if you could go to iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app and leave a review. You would be my favorite person ever. Thank you so much again, and I hope you have a Positively Delighted day. See you next time.